Hey guys, what's up? It's Jess. Welcome back to Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. I'm here for the second day and uh, we are currently in the seed store, which is kind of like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory <laughs> for those of us who are still little children inside and we love seeds. Uh, yesterday I took you guys around and we just vlogged the Baker Creek uh, operation just so you can kind of see what all goes into it and today I'm gonna talk to you guys a little about some different varieties and some different things because I know a lot of you are spending these lovely days uh, of winter curled up on your couch with your catalog and making your plans for your spring garden so let's go take a look around now the seed store is not um, inclusive of every variety that's in the catalog so especially some of the new things that that were just released this year. We're not gonna see them in here today. And of course, some things might be out. Um, they're constantly refilling these shelves. So we're just gonna take a look at the varieties that we do see. I get asked all the time by people, if I only have enough space for one, which one should it be? And I have a really difficult time answering that question. And I'll tell you why. I kind of have like this philosophy about learning and I'm a homeschool mom so this kind of comes out sometimes I think in my YouTube videos. Um, I don't like to tell people what to think. I like to tell people how to think. I like to teach people why to think something. Um, but I don't, I don't like to say this is the one, period. Um, so I have a hard time like I, I'll try to make lists sometimes of like you know, if you could only grow one of each variety. So I'm like, I just can't do this because it feels like it goes against everything that I feel as a teacher. Like, I don't want to tell you what to think. So today, I'm just going to highlight some varieties that I've had success with, that you guys have told me that you've had success with, and just tell you about them to kind of narrow down your list. So if you are trying to figure out what to do with a small space, what to do in your first garden, maybe this will give you some information to decide um, the how and why of these things. Obviously we have a lot of seeds to look at here. This is like kind of the catalog hands on. So as we go through these varieties, I also want you to keep in mind that I'm growing in Central Arkansas Zone 7B. I have a long growing season. It's hot, it's humid. Um, the things that I deal with and why some of these are my favorites may be completely different where you are, um, but I'll just share my experience about them. And uh, I do also encourage you guys to look on Baker Creek's website. All of these varieties are listed with reviews from other gardeners that list where they're growing, how they're growing, um, and it's a really good way to get a feel on whether a variety is going to work for you or not because you might be able to find somebody else that's growing in a similar fashion to you. Okay, let's start first. I guess we could talk about amaranth up here. Um, I have not grown just a lot of amaranth. The only ones that I've grown was one called Hot Biscuits, which is actually not sold here, and one called Love Lies Bleeding, and the Love Lies Bleeding was really, really beautiful. It was very prolific. Um, but I didn't really do a lot with that, so I don't really know. I haven't actually grown a lot of these things like artichokes and cardoons. Um, however, beans are something that we grow a lot of, and this is something that I've tried a lot of the varieties here. Um, I think that if I were going to say, okay, you can only grow one bush bean, I would probably settle on the blue like bush 274. It's really good. Uh, it stays pretty tender. It grows a lot. It's a bush variety, so if you don't have uh, supports, vertical supports, it's a good one. And then the Canter, I grew this last year, and I also liked this. I found that it was pretty, pretty tender. Um, it was a little bit bigger. The pods were a little bit bigger. And of course the Dragon Tongue is kind of a go-to for me. This has been in my garden for something like eight years. And the Dragon Tongue is really, really beautiful now. It's real streaky, as you can see, but it, um, it cooks green, so when you cook it, all the purple goes away. Uh, this is listed usually as a bush variety, but I have found, and I've grown the seeds from multiple places, I've found that it does have runners, and so how I usually grow the dragon tongue, I grow it with the plants kind of like, I, I do blocks instead of rows usually because I'm doing raised beds, and I'll put little teepees right in the middle with like sticks that go up about three feet tall, stakes, and they do really great with that. They grow a lot. I always grow that one even though it, it is slightly stringy. I like that one. 
And then there's one more right here for a pole bean, the purple potted pole bean. This was a really, really good grower for me last year. They covered a six foot um, fence that I had them growing on about 25 feet long and produced baskets and baskets full. Now you have to pick these young. The bigger they get, the tougher they get. Um, but I really do like the purple potted pole bean. See, this is where it's hard for me because I've grown a lot of these that were good. Marvel of Venice was pretty good. Um, Roma was good. Red Swan Bush. But as far as if you're trying to just do a couple of varieties, those were the ones that kind of stood out to me. And I guess if I had to narrow it down to one, I would do the purple potted for a pole and maybe the blue lake for a bush. Now here we have got long beans. Um, and I tout the merits of the Chinese red noodle bean. You guys have seen these growing on my arch trellis. Now, my friend Jill and I were actually driving here this morning. We were discussing the noodle bean. The noodle bean is actually not like your typical green bean. It shines more in like Asian styles of cooking. With green beans, you're typically going to boil those, but noodle beans get really waterlogged. And so the way you cook these is like a quick blanch and then a stir fry is really the best way to cook these and a little bit of oil. These don't get like that soft feeling of other green beans or even if you like your green beans a little bit um, less cooked, al dente, I guess. Um, these have a squeaky, chewy feeling to them. It's a very different texture. Now, I like it. Jill was saying she didn't really like it, but she was saying that this was one of her really great sellers because she does market gardening and growing for restaurants. And so she'll keep growing it for that reason. I'll grow it to eat it. And we both agree that it looks majestic growing on an arch trellis. Okay, let's look here at beets. Now, the bull's blood is kind of one of my go-to favorites as well as the Detroit Dark Red. Those are just the ones that in all that I've tried that I like the best now. Um, I was speaking with the Baker Creek employee that runs the seed shop the other day and she was saying that her favorite to grow is the early wonder beets because you get such a nice crop of greens off these as well. So you get beets sooner and greens. Now the beans we're talking about, you'll have to wait until after the frost is passed to plant. However, beets you can plant before the frost. Your root vegetables like beets and turnips and carrots, um, those kinds of things can go into the garden before the frost is over. Now the, gar the ground has to be thawed. You can plant peas, your brassicas, your lettuces, all of that stuff can go in once the ground is thawed, but it doesn't matter if it's still getting kind of frosty at night. Just a side note, this is actually on my list to grow this year. Um, I've never grown it before, but my son's name is Jackson, and so I like to grow things that have their name in it, and those are also beautiful, and I love lima beans. <laughs> okay, let's come over here, and I, there are some things I'm just not gonna be able to comment on. Things like Brussels sprouts, I've actually never grown those. Buckwheat, never grown that. Um, cabbage, I have, I have grown, and I actually have not met a cabbage I didn't like, but I really, really, really love this Cour de Bue. I thought it was really interesting um, how it's kind of this ox heart shape, which that's what Cour de Bue means. But it's really beautiful, it's very tasty. They grew very well for me, so I really enjoyed those. Um, I saw these growing in Baker Creek's greenhouse yesterday and they were massive early Jersey Wakefield. I do know a thing or two about carrots though, and I actually really love growing carrots. I have a few personal favorites. I've tried several kinds. Um, Danvers Half Long is like a really good go-to for a really uh, traditional carrot. It grows well in a lot of different soils. That's like, a, that's like a good baseline carrot. Also the Cosmic Purple is one that I've always had success with. Every time I've planted it, it's done pretty well. Um, it's got a, it's not a real sweet carrot. It's more of like a kind of piney, strong carrot flavor. I really like that. And then of course there's the Black Nebula and this is one, uh, the Black Nebula and the Pusa Aceta. These are very similar carrots, both really dark with antho uh, cyanines. And I really like both of these. Oh darn, I forgot one. <laughs> I knew I was going to do this, y'all. Kyoto Red. Uh, I got to actually, I've never grown this, but I got to try it in Jigger's Greenhouse in the spring, and it was fantastic. So that's one that I would really love to grow. Fantastic flavor and so pretty. All right, cucumbers. So for the first-time gardener or the small gardener, cucumbers are a great thing to grow. Cucumbers are really, really prolific. You can grow them vertically. I prefer to grow them vertically. So like they are one of the big stars of the arch trellises at, in my garden during the 
late spring and early summer. Um, and they just, they need a lot of water, but they're really forgiving and they produce a lot of food. So if you've been going to the grocery store and spending 50 cents each on cucumbers or a dollar each or dollar fifty, depending on if you're buying organic and where you live, um, being able to grow cucumbers and go out and pick three or four every day, you're like, wow, this is going to save me a lot of money, especially if you're a big salad eater or a juicer or if you want to make your own pickles. Um, I always like to grow the unusual stuff. I love growing like the nice Japanese long cucumbers. I love growing the different just unusual kinds. However, I always, always, always have in my garden either Boston pickling or Chicago pickling cucumbers. These are two that have been just really uh, good growers for me. Now those are pickling cucumbers which means they're kind of shorter and just uh, a harder variety. Now for a slicer, um, I like to grow market moors, which I don't see. Oh, they're up there. Here's the market moor. And uh, they're a little longer and, and just better for slicing. Those three are either one of the pickling cucumbers, I usually don't plant both of them, one of those in the market more is, is kind of like a baseline. Now, on top of that, I'll grow Japanese long, I've grown a Monica, I'll grow a white cucumber. I really like growing the Parisian pickling to pick them really small, but no matter what, like if I only were growing two, it would be the market more and one of those pickling cucumbers because they produce so much. And eggplants. Eggplants are one of those things that I get really wide-eyed about, and I'm like, I want to grow them all because they're so beautiful. Actually, funny story, back before I was a gardener, I used to shop at farmer's markets and it was uh, really pretty streaky eggplants like this that I would purchase at the farmer's market that made me like want to get into heirloom gardening. It was one of the things that kind of pushed me over the edge of being like, there are all these things out there that I've never seen before and I need to try them, so I'm gonna have to grow them. Um, and still, I kind of get a little starry eyed looking at eggplants. However, I do have kind of, again, my baseline that I always grow, and then the others are just kind of extra to that. And that is the really traditional Black Beauty eggplant right here. Now, this is actually not what you usually see. It's similar to what you usually see in the grocery store, but these grow a little bit more bulbous, I guess. And then the Ping Tongue is one that I, I like to grow, and I've grown this for a few years. It's really great in stir fries. Those two are kind of my go-to. One year I had like a total eggplant year and I grew like, grew like six kinds and they all produce like crazy. Um, and then last year I had hardly any. <laughs> okay, here let's talk a little bit more about these lettuces and kales, which these are things that you're gonna plant sooner since they can handle a little more cold weather. I love a, a great kale variety, so this is one that's hard for me to just nail down. My one that is always there is the blue curled scotch, which is kind of like your basic kale, what you're used to seeing in the grocery store. And kale is a cousin to cabbage, um, and so it's not surprising that some different kales, they really, they, they are very, very similar to cabbage, like a thicker leaf, a much thicker bite, and I like those. Um, that stuff like this tranchuta kale, that's gonna be, that reminds me very much of like cabbage leaf. I found, I think the thousand head kale was kind of a, a little more like cabbage, but still kind of kale, that was huge. And then of course there's what we call dinosaur kale is actually technically listed as a cabbage, Nero de Toscana. Um, that, so you can see kale, kale and cabbage are like brother and sister. But the blue curled scotch, it's just, I don't know if it's just because it's my old favorite, but for the th reasons I use kale for juicing, for kale chips, for soups, I've found that one to just be really versatile good. Now I grow a lot of them, but I always grow that one. Um, there aren't just a ton of varieties of collards that I've come across and tried. However, I've had great success with the Georgia Southern Creole collards. So those are the ones that kind of always stick with. I don't grow a lot of varieties of those. That's the one I use. And then with lettuces, I actually get really um, ambitious with lettuce, actually. <laughs> And I end up uh, trying new lettuces all the time, but the one that I have found that I liked more than the rest, um, and that I continually grow, even though I'm trying lots of other kinds, is the Marvel of Four Seasons. Now, I'm not even, I'm not gonna even try the French pronunciation, I'll just show it to you. So, um, yeah, there's that. 
definitely not French, definitely Arkansas. Baker Creek has this red wing lettuce mix. And this is, is something that I've grown many times and you harvest that as baby greens and I really like that. As well as the Rocky Top lettuce mix. And these are all just mixed seeds of different lettuces that you're not gonna space out. You could space them out. If you wanted to grow those into head lettuces, you could space those things out um, individually, but or you can broadcast them close together and pick them young as baby greens. And both of those mixes to me you can't go wrong with. Um, actually, when I've shared about growing greens in salad bags, those are kind of my two go-to mixes to put in salad bags to grow greens. Of course, you know my go-to for small personal melons is the Kajari. I've raved over this. Many of you have grown it. Most of you have liked it. Uh, that's one that I really always will grow. It's kind of dear to my heart at this point because it was kind of my first thing that you guys grabbed hold of. And I don't know. I love the Kajari melon. I love the story that's behind it. Okra. I could grow every single okra on this shelf and enjoy them. If I had to choose down to just one or two or three, I think this is one that I would always, I'll always have some sort of variety, um, is the Clemson Spineless is just like, you can't go wrong with. This is a really, really great okra. And I also like having at least one of the these guys, these kind of like fatter, squattier pods. I really liked Alabama Red. Another one that's very similar to this is Texas Hill Country. And so I like to kind of grow at least one of each. I usually go ahead and throw a red into the mix. I've done all three of these and they're all, to me, equally good. Now, peas are another thing that you can get in your garden early for those of you who are chomping at the bit to get something growing. Um, as soon as your, th your soil is thawed, uh, you can plant these. They can handle temperatures that are below freezing. Um, I have tried a lot of different kinds. As far as shelling peas, um, I've had okay success with the Wando here. Now, to be completely frank, mostly the peas in my garden get picked by my kids and eaten before they get shelled. We love the Sugar Magnolia Tendril Pea. This is probably the only pea that I would say is like our go-to will always be there. The others we like to try new things, but that Sugar Magnolia Tendril, I just, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful plant. It's very fairy tale with all of its little curly cues, and it's a really tasty pea. It's a really pretty purple um, sugar pea, and we really like that one. Now, getting into peppers, this is hard for me to narrow down to one or two because your needs could be very, very different than mine. And with peppers, I find that you really, either you love growing peppers and so you're gonna grow a lot of these different varieties and just a simple one won't do, or you don't love peppers and so you would be fine growing jalapenos and serranos and habaneros if you like them spicy. And there's also so many different reasons. Like for instance, like if you wanna grow a bell pepper because you like to saute them, make fajitas, uh, slice them up and put them in salads. There's all these great reasons that you would use bell peppers that obviously you're not going to use jalapenos for and you're certainly not going to use super hots for. So I don't know that you could say, well, what about one pepper? Maybe you could think about like one sweet pepper and one seasoning pepper and one spicy pepper. So I'll just kind of give you some of my standouts. The Tam Jalapeno, this is kind of like my tried and true jalapeno, I've really got one. I like the Sugar Rush Peach, and they just came out with the Sugar Rush Red, which I'm excited to try. Now, I don't grow super hot, so I cannot give you any sort of input into, like, these guys. I have no idea. Um, I cannot handle that. These are, you know, hotter than a jalapeno. Really great flavor. I really liked them. I grow Serranos every year. These are my favorite to put in salsa. They are a little bit, a um, little hotter than a jalapeno. They grow a little skinnier and they're really prolific. This is one that I am I'm really interested in. I actually grew this, but I only got a couple off of it, but that was not the pepper's fault. It was my fault. I didn't do very well with my peppers this year. Uh, the habanada is, is like similar to a habanero, but without the heat. I really, really liked the manganji pepper. This is very, very, very sweet and a great, great pepper flavor. I will always grow this one from now on. For sweet peppers, I really like the, the um, manganji. I really like the Marconi peppers, but I still do like to grow a bell pepper. And, my, and I really like this Ozark Giant. 
as well as the King of the North. And this is one I've had success with in Arkansas, obviously um, not the North, but it is supposed to be better for colder climates because it's an earlier variety. So that might be one for those of you who are growing in um, shorter growing seasons to check out. And here's the Marconi. Now this comes in golden too, I believe, but this is a really delicious sweet pepper. It's juicy, it's got a lot of flavor and really meaty, thick walled. I love this pepper. I have shared with you many times before about my love of radishes. Um, I, I believe radishes should be in every garden. They are so good roasted. It's a great alternative for like a starch in your meals if you roast them. And they're easy to grow. They're just a great morale booster for the beginning gardener. Um, with that said, there are so many different varieties. I've yet to meet a radish I didn't like. Like I've grown so many kinds and I really like them. However, I do have a single favorite that I always put in my garden, no matter what else I'm trying, and that is the French breakfast radish. Um, I just really like this one. It's got really soft skin. It doesn't get a lot of knots in it. Um, it's great picked, roots being about this big. And I just really, I really like it. And um, I think that might've been the first radish that I ever grew. Maybe I'm a little fond of it for that reason, but the French breakfast would be my single radish that I pick, but they're all really good. <laughs> oh, squash. You're so lovely. Uh, squash is another one. Oh man, they're all hard to narrow down. This is hard. This is a hard thing to do. So I like to grow a large variety of squash. Um, it's kind of hard for me to say, okay, these are, this is what I will always grow um, because there's so many of them that I love. I really like patty pan squashes, the Pattison, uh, Golden, Marbury, um, and then there's the scalloped green and white one. Uh, those are great. Um, I really love the Rontany squash. It's right here. Um, that one grows, that's so early. It usually comes out in like 40 days. It's usually one of the first things that I harvest out of the summer garden. And the thing is I actually don't ever grow. There's not a squash that I grow every single year. Um, I just mix it up because I haven't, I don't really like dislike any of them. I think if I had to like say, okay, I only have room to grow one kind that I really want to have a lot of confidence that it's going to do well, the yellow scallop. This is probably one of the most resistant and prolific squashes that I've grown. Um, that, that plant lasted a lot longer. I deal with really bad squash bugs where I live. Um, but I really, really like that one. I actually haven't had a ton of success with winter squash because of the whole squash bug issue that I deal with. So I don't have a ton of input on what is my favorite. Um, I know what I like to buy from farmers markets and stores. I know that the Honey Boat Delicata is one of my favorite in flavor, as well as the Red Curry and the, is this, no, there's a butter, butter cup. I don't see it here. Let's talk tomatoes. I think I'm needing to do a separate video that's like my top 10 varieties because I just, I really love to grow tomatoes. You guys know this. Um, I'm going to try to tell you a couple for those of you who are just getting started or you have a small space, but this is not easy for me. Of course, I love Dr. Richie. Um, this tomato grows really large. It produces a lot. I really like this one. It's one of my favorites. Paul Robeson. Um, incredible flavor in this tomato. Uh, this one is not huge, it's more a medium size. This is actually new to my must grow list. It made it on last year, the Creole tomato. I really, really liked how uniform these grew. I found that these were a really good tomato to use for, um, for canning. They're medium, they're globe, they didn't crack a lot, and they had a really good, just basic tomato flavor. So this is a really good one if you're looking for something like that. And here, one of my favorite Baker Creek varieties for canning is the Amish Paste. Goodness, let me get a mess of the store. This has been a very consistently good producer for me. Um, they're really meaty. They're really, they grow pretty big. Um, I've had almost two pound tomatoes come off the Amish Paste before. And this is one that I always grow, and it's one of my favorite ones to make sauce out of. Um, also, to be noted, uh, Wild Boar Farms varieties. Um, the tomato, the pink Berkeley tie-dye and the large barred boar, they're very similar and those are some of my favorite slicers. And for cherries, my must grows are the blueberry variety from wild boar. Um, these, they come in three different colors. 
are so prolific, so tasty. The yellow tastes different than the red, and um, they're always the first and the last to get going in my garden. Now, for those of you who are starting out in your first garden and you may have like a small space and you might think, well, I don't really have the space to do flowers. And if that's the case, I encourage you to get a pot and plant some flowers in it. Um, I really feel like having some flowers in your gardening space is very, very beneficial. It brings in pollinators, so it's creating a habitat for beneficial insects. Um, I really love growing zinnias. They grow super easy and they'll grow well in a pot, um, in a container, or in your garden bed if you want to give them some space so they get really big. And here, are my favorite varieties of zinnias um, are this queen lime mix. There's the queen lime red, orange, <laughs> lime and just the solid lime. These these varieties right here, I love, and I love planting these together. They're just those vintage muted tones. I love these flowers. So that's my walk through the seed store. I, I know there are a few things that I didn't cover. They were just things that I didn't really feel like I had a definitive say on or one that I would always plant, so I didn't wanna just make something up. I just don't have one. Uh, things like watermelons and winter squash, you know, I, I don't really have a favorite because I haven't, I haven't grown enough to really know. So uh, with things that I did share though, those are the ones that I will consistently grow in my garden as well as all of my other fun things that I love to try. I love to try all the different varieties uh, and there are a lot of them. But thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I hope this was helpful to you and um, didn't cost you too much money. <laughs> I bless you until next time.